This chapter is going to cover the special senses. Specifically, we're going to start with vision, and there is also taste, smell, and in the ear, not only is there hearing, but there's also equilibrium. So there's going to be five special senses that are covered in this chapter. And what's important about this is there's special sensory receptors, so there's not going to be the same general receptors that you learned about in the peripheral nervous system. These are going to be more special receptors that are much more complex. So for example, in vision, we're going to be specifically referring to the photoreceptors. And the photoreceptors are going to be the rods and also the cone. So the eye itself is going to have three layers to it. It's going to have a lens and also some liquid areas called the humors. There's also some accessory structures, which we're going to talk about next. There's the eyebrows, the eyelids, the conjunctiva, the lacrimal apparatus, and also the extrinsic eye muscles. So the lacrimal apparatus is shown here on this slide. And specifically, it begins with the lacrimal gland, which is found on the lateral side of the eye. And this lacrimal gland is very important. It's going to produce important uh, fluid, the tears, which contains mucus, an important antibody, and also lysozyme. So it's very important for protection of our eye. Every time that we blink, this fluid is going to be released through the excretory ducts of the lacrimal glands, and it's going to lubricate the eye. It's going to wash from the lateral side to the medial side. So this fluid is very important. It's going to cleanse the eye. It's going to protect the eye surface. And it's also going to be important for moistening and lubricating the eye. So you can see the pathway shown here, the excretory ducts, crossing the eye medially, entering into the lacrimal punctum, the openings, and then finally draining into the nasal lacrimal duct, as you can see here. And then eventually it's going to flow outward through the nose. So this explains when we have sniffles or a congested nose that there's really no way, nowhere for the fluid to actually leave the eye. So that explains the watery eyes and makes sense. One of the other important accessory structures would be the extrinsic eye muscles. And there are six of them. Uh, and four out of six of them kind of make sense based on their words. They're the rectus muscles. And... They are located above, below, or to the side of the eye. And uh, so you need to know their action as well as the cranial nerve that controls them. And the cranial nerve number three, the oculomotor, is going to control four out of six of them. The two exceptions would be the lateral rectus muscle, which you see here. And it's controlled by cranial nerve number six, the abducens nerve. And the superior oblique is going to be another one of these exceptions, controlled by the trochlear nerve. And one of the reasons um, is because it kind of um, acts like a pulley system. If we look at the superior oblique muscle, it's located on top of the eye, and it's going to depress the eye and also turn it laterally. One of the reasons that there's um, more muscles that um, help to turn it laterally is because it balances out the ones that turn it medially. So you need to know the function as well as the cranial nerves. When some of these aren't working correctly, we have a risk of having double vision, which is called diplopia. And there's also another disorder called strabismus. And there's external strabismus and also internal strabismus. And that turns the eye either laterally or medially. So looking at the three layers of the eye, we're going to start, first start with the outermost layer of the eye. And this outermost layer of the eye is a very tough layer. It's actually a type of dense, avascular, so without blood vessels. And it's a type of connective tissue. And it has two parts. The sclera is actually going to be continuous with the outer layer of the brain called the dura mater. And in the front we can see that the sclera actually becomes the cornea as well. The cornea is a really interesting tissue because it's the only tissue in the human body that can actually be transplanted 
without any fear of rejection. The middle layer is the blood vessel layer, and it is called the choroid, and it's the middle coat of the eyeball, and it has the blood vessels. These blood vessels are very important for absorbing the light and preventing the light from spreading. So it doesn't, it keeps the light and the image focused on the back of the retina where the image can actually form. The uh, choroid is going to be made up, it's going to become a ciliary body. And then there's also what's called a ciliary process. And the ciliary process is going to secrete a fluid into the anterior segment. And this is the anterior segment is made up of the aqueous humor. And what we see here is the two examples of what automatically happens to the iris. The iris is not just for color. Its uh, most important job is that it's made up of two smooth muscle, smooth muscles that are going to respond to um, the parasympathetic nervous system and also the sympathetic nervous system. So the parasympathetic nervous system is going to be specifically responsive to close vision and also very bright light. Then if you think about the opposite, what happens when you go into a very dark room, your sympathetic division is going to be activated and your pupils are going to dilate. So this is not only for distant vision, but it's also for very dim light as well. So that's the middle layer of the eye. And then the probably the most important layer of the eye, because this is where phototransduction actually occurs, this is going to be the sensory layer or the retina. And what happens here is there's millions of photoreceptors. And those photoreceptors are going to be the rods as well as the cones. And you need to know the pathway of light. What happens is once the light um, it goes right through the pupil and it's focused hopefully right on the fovea centralis, the back of the eye. And we can see the pathway of light going from left to right on your screen. And the photoreceptors are first going to be activated, the rods and the cones. Then there is a graded potential between the photoreceptor and the bipolar cell. Another graded potential between the bipolar cell and the ganglion cell. And it's the ganglion cell which is going to produce the most important part, which is the action potential, which is going to continue along the optic nerve, cranial nerve number two, to the occipital lobe of the brain for interpretation. So looking at the back of the eye, we see the blood supply shown here on this slide. The neural retina has two different uh, supplies. The outer third is the choroid, which remember, recall, is the middle layer. And the inner two thirds is from the central artery and vein. And we can see that shown right here. And the most important part of this is the macula lutea. So when patients get macular degeneration, that's going to be a degeneration of the very important macula. So if we were to think of the macula lutea kind of like a dartboard, the very center of the dartboard would be the fovea centralis. And the fovea centralis is going to have the highest amount of cones. So it's kind of like the best possible vision that we have. The next slide is showing the anterior segment and also the posterior segment. First of all, the posterior segment is containing the vitreous humor. And it is a clear gel which most interestingly is actually present from when we're born up until we die. So it never actually changes. The aqueous humor, however, is going to be in the anterior segment. And it's very important because it nourishes the lens, nourishes the cornea, and also removes waste. And if there's problems with aqueous humor, for example, clouding of the lens, that could lead to a cataract, which is what we see in this picture right here. So cataracts are very common. They're easily removed. And we see the pathway of um, production of the fluid in the aqueous humor on this chart. We have the aqueous humor producing. The fluid is produced by filtration, number one here. And then it flows into the aqueous humor. And then it's going to be drained by this vein, also called the canal of Schlem. But it's also called the scleral 
venous sinus. So when the pressure increases in this area, it can actually lead to glaucoma. So glaucoma is a homeostatic imbalance that is associated with increased intraocular pressure in the aqueous humor.